All right, welcome to The Explainer. Today, we are diving deep into two of the most critical infections you can encounter in a clinical setting, peripharyngeal and retropharyngeal abscesses. Now, these aren't your run-of-the-mill infections. They demand really sharp diagnostic skills and, more importantly, decisive action. Let's get right into it. So here's our game plan. We're going to break this down into six key areas. We'll start with the basics, the anatomy and clinical signs. Then we'll get into the crucial microbiology, figuring out what we're actually fighting. After that, we'll cover the cornerstones of treatment, touch on prevention, look at the very serious risks involved, and finally, we'll put your knowledge to the test. First things first, we have to understand the disease itself. What are we really looking at when we talk about these deep neck abscesses? And maybe more importantly, how is a patient going to present? Okay, so at their very core, these things are collections of pus, but they're trapped deep inside the neck within these complex fascial planes. This is not a simple skin infection. We're talking about abscesses that are literally right next to the most critical structures in your body, your airway, major blood vessels, vital nerves. And that location, that anatomical real estate, is exactly what makes them so incredibly dangerous. So what are the red flags you should be looking for? Well, the patient is almost certainly going to come in with severe localized pain. But the real telltale signs, given the anatomy we just talked about, are profound autonophagia and dysphagia. That's incredibly painful and difficult swallowing. We're not talking about a simple sore throat here. This points to something much bigger, much deeper. You couple that with systemic signs, you know, high fevers, chills, general malaise, and the picture of a serious deep neck infection starts to become alarmingly clear. Okay, so you have a strong clinical suspicion. Now, how do you prove it? We have to figure out who the microbial culprits are. You can't effectively treat what you haven't identified. And for these infections, getting the microbiology right is absolutely everything. And here is the single most important principle of this entire process. Forget about superficial swabs. A quick swab of the throat isn't going to tell you anything about what's growing deep inside a walled-off pocket of pus. The gold standard, and really the only reliable sample, is pus that you get directly from the abscess itself, usually during the surgical drainage procedure. Getting this sample right is what determines whether your targeted antibiotic therapy is going to work. Once you have that precious pus sample, a really meticulous process kicks off in the lab. It starts with a gram stain, which gives you a quick, preliminary look at what you might be dealing with. Then that sample gets plated onto a whole range of different media, designed to grow both the aerobic and the anaerobic bugs. After incubating for up to five days, the real work starts, identifying the exact species of bacteria and, crucially, running tests to see which specific antibiotics will actually kill them. So, who are the usual suspects? Well, these infections are very often polymicrobial, which just means there's a mix of different bacteria all working together. You'll almost always find anaerobes like Fusobacterium necroforum, that's a classic culprit, working alongside aerobes like Streptococcus pyogenes. Staphylococcus aureus is also a very frequent guest at the party. And you have to remember, in certain patients, say someone who's immunocompromised, you have to broaden your differential to include organisms like Haemophilus or even Enterobacteriaceae. All right, we've identified the enemy. So how do we actually treat this? Well, management really stands on two pillars, and you absolutely need both of them. Aggressive surgical drainage and smart, targeted antimicrobial therapy. I want you to let this sink in. Antibiotics are vital, but they are not the primary treatment. They are an adjunct therapy. Why? Because antibiotics have a really hard time penetrating a thick, walled-off collection of pus. The source of the infection has to be physically removed. So aggressive surgical drainage isn't just an option. It is the absolute unequivocal cornerstone of therapy. Without it, the infection just won't clear. So while you're waiting for those culture results to come back from the lab, you have to start treatment. This table is your empirical playbook. If you're suspecting the usual mix of strep and anaerobes, you'll start with a combination of benzyl penicillin and metronidazole. If you have a high suspicion for staph aureus being involved, you'll swap out the penicillin for fluclexacillin. And for your really high-risk patients, you'll add another layer of heavy-hitting coverage with gentamicin. Now just remember, these are starting points for about a two-week IV course in adults. For children, it's a completely different ballgame. 
Dosing must always be based on weight and age using pediatric-specific guidelines. You know, managing the patient in front of you is one huge challenge, but protecting everyone else in the hospital, that's another. So let's shift gears for a moment and talk about the critical and frankly often overlooked aspects of infection control and prevention. Look, this is all about the non-negotiable fundamental rules of hospital hygiene. It's how you break the chain of transmission. Strict adherence to PPE. We're talking gowns, the right masks, gloves, the whole nine yards. That is your first line of defense. But beyond that, for patients who are known to be colonized with something nasty like MRSA, you need proactive decolonization protocols. This, along with screening your at-risk patients, is how you contain the threat and keep it from spreading. All right, moving on. The reason we take all of these measures so incredibly seriously is because the alternative is, well, it's dire. Let's take a look at the cascade of terrible things that can happen if these abscesses aren't managed swiftly and correctly. The stakes here are just incredibly high. The most immediate, life-threatening danger is airway obstruction. The abscess literally swells up and chokes off the patient's ability to breathe. Sepsis is right behind it, where the body's response to the infection spirals out of control. The bacteria can also spill into the bloodstream, setting up shop elsewhere, causing things like meningitis. And in the absolute worst-case scenario, this can devolve into necrotizing fasciitis, a flesh-eating infection that progresses with terrifying speed and is often fatal. All right, you've seen the science, you've seen the strategy, now it's time to put that knowledge into practice. Let's run through a few quick scenarios and test your clinical decision-making. Here's your first case. This is a classic presentation. A 45-year-old man, bad throat pain, can't swallow, has a fever. You suspect an abscess. What is your single most crucial, most important initial move? The answer is B, urgent surgical drainage. Look, you're gonna start antibiotics, of course, but the cornerstone, the action that directly addresses the life-threatening problem is getting that pus out. Delaying drainage is not an option when the airway is at risk. Next question. This one is all about your first line drug choice. You suspect the most common culprits are at play. What's the go-to antibiotic combination you're gonna start with? The correct answer here is benzyl penicillin plus metronidazole. This combination gives you excellent targeted coverage for the most likely suspects, the strep and the anaerobes. You would only bring in a drug like flucloxacillin if your clinical suspicion for staph aureus was particularly high. The goal is targeted, intelligent coverage, not just throwing the kitchen sink at the patient. All right, last one. This case adds a critical variable. The patient is an eight-year-old child. What is the absolute number one golden rule when you're thinking about antimicrobial dosing in this patient? And the answer, of course, is C. This is a non-negotiable point of safety. Children are not just small adults. You never, ever guess or just scale down an adult dose. Dosing requires precise, careful calculation based on that child's specific weight and age. And you must always use a dedicated pediatric formulary to ensure you're being both effective and, most importantly, safe. And that brings us to the end. We've walked through the diagnosis, the microbiology, and the management of these really severe infections. But I want to leave you with one final thought to take away. How would all of these principles change for your most complex patient? Think about someone who's immunocompromised with a known history of multidrug-resistant bugs. The core principles stay the same, but the challenge becomes infinitely more complex. Thank you for joining us.